and I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's Ask a Light Live webinar. Uh, I'm David Porter, a member of the Ask a Light Executive and the facilitator for this session. Um, for this afternoon's webinar, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck Woody Ogo from Turnitin, uh, who will be introducing today's presenters. So Chuck, take it away. Thank you so much, David. I hope everyone can hear me loud and clear. Um, while I was very flattered by the uh, number of LinkedIn messages asking if I was presenting, it's unfo uh, very unfortunately I'm not presenting, but I'm very excited about our presenter. So today we're, look we're looking at contract cheating, e-cheating, and academic integrity. We're going to look at practical approaches to ensuring dig digital equity. And with us today, uh, or who will be presenting in this session is um, Professor Kath Ellis of University of New South Wales. Um, popularly known for her work in con contract cheating, and Dr. Jasmine Thomas, who's also um, a big name in University of Southern Queens Queensland, also looking at around e-cheating and contract cheating. Um, like David has pointed out, the, we're going to be recording this call. Um, questions um, can be posted in the chat um, forum, and we'll respond to the questions at the end of um, the session. I'd like to now hand over to um, Professor Kath Ellis, who's going to be leading um, the presentation and um, later on Dr. Jasmine Thomas will uh, also present on the topic as well. Thank you. Over to you Kath. Thanks Chuck. Um, I'm not sure if you want to just take the screen off there for a moment David but um, I'm just going to speak to camera before I share my screen. So um, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to be a part of this webinar today. It's, um, it's great to be talking to the Ascalite community. I've been to a few conferences and it's just such an amazing community and I'm seeing lots of names I recognise. Um, but before I go any further, I'm going to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm located today, which is the Bejigal people of the Eora Nation, which is the land of the Kensington campus, and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which is the location of the Paddington campus. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Indigenous people who are with us today and always was or always will be. So thank you, Ascalite, um, for inviting me um, and Jasmine to um, be a part of this series. Um, really want to call out to Jasmine and the amazing um, work that she's doing at USQ, and I, I know you're all really looking forward to hearing from her. But what I'm going to try and do to start with is kind of set the big picture context and, and then Jasmine's going to give us some really fantastic examples of how she's been leading on the practical elements of engaging with the problem of contract cheating at her local level. So really what I want to start with is just by sort of saying this is the soapbox I'm on at the moment, I'm afraid. I mean, those of you who know me will know that I have been on a soapbox about this for quite some time. I'm not going onto that old soapbox of awareness raising about contract cheating. We know about contract cheating. We know that it's a thing. We know that it's happening right under our noses. We know that it's a global problem. It's a global industry that's operating at an industrial scale, that's supplying, um, that, that operates with a very sophisticated business model and is supplying a mature international market. We know all of that. We know that they are predatory. We know that they have no scruples. We know that our students are vulnerable to this. We know that six to ten percent of students are engaging in these behaviours. We know the bulk of them are sourcing that work from friends, family um, and are not paying for it, but a small proportion are paying for it. We know all of this. But what I want to be focusing our attention on today is, first of all, practical approaches or responses to this problem, like getting to the practical solutions focus side of this, but also to really focus, because it's Ascalite, um, focus on what role technology can play in this and what role technology should play and can play now, but will be playing for us in the future. So trying to paint that bigger context to allow Jasmine to go into much more of the detail. And what I've done today is I've kind of mashed up a few things that I've prepared or papers that I've delivered earlier to kind of pull this together into a, a narrative that sets out the context. 
And I have to start by acknowledging the extraordinary thought leadership that I um, enjoy from my colleague Kay Murdoch, who is in the call, I think he's here. Um, last time I looked, he was here. Um, because what I'm going to share with you has his fingerprints all over it, as well as a former colleague of ours, David House. And what you'll start to see is how this has been a conversation between the three of us in our different roles. Kane is an investigator. He's a professional staff member who is employed in a central integrity unit here at UNSW. And it's his job to detect and investigate contract cheating. And we're developing a new hashtag, which is make it someone's job. Um, because one of the things that we're really advocating for is that this needs proper resource and it needs proper centralised attention. Whereas I'm working on the academic side of things, um, on the academic um, judgment side of things. And what we're really advocating for today, and I hope Kane doesn't mind me using the word we liberally here. I'm sure we'll put something in the chat if he doesn't like me using it. But what we are advocating for in our conversation is very much a partnership and leadership model in terms of addressing this problem of contract cheating. Because one of the things that I'm getting increasingly worried about is we've known about this problem for a very long time. Thomas Lancaster um, and some of his research colleagues uh, first coined this term back in 2006. We've had the jolly great big My Master scandal happened in 2014 and 2015. We've known about it for a very long time, but we don't seem to have made much inroads in terms of actually addressing the problem. And I think the time has come. Um, we've known about this for too long. It's a, it's a persistent problem. It's a wicked problem but we need to do something about it. And the thing that I want to share with you today is that we can do things and we should do things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen now and um, Chuck's perhaps you could give me um, a verbal indication that I've got this sort of sorted out um, correctly when I've got it up. Um, yeah, OK, yes. so what I'm going to here Thanks, Chuck. Is I'm just I'm going to do a kind of quick tour through a paper that Kane um, and I delivered at the ACI, ICAI conference, um, the virtual ICAI conference this year. And you'll see that um, this is co-authored with Mark Rickson from Turnitin. And this is the point that we're trying to make. It is a partnership between the academic and investigative staff and the technology providers. But you'll see the title is From Reactive, Ineffective Whack-A-Mole to Effective Collaborative Action. And that's what I'm really advocating for at the moment, that we move away from the energy sapping, um, reactive and ultimately ineffective whack-a-mole strategy that we've been employing for a very long time and start thinking in a more collaborative way to work against this problem together. Because I've said this many, many times, many of you all have heard me say this before, this is a sector-wide problem and it needs a sector-wide solution. So one of the things that um, I want to start from is a piece of evidence. So this is a piece of evidence that we developed from um, a study that I was involved in, um, led by the late Tracy Bretag um, and Rowena Harper, um, where we did some staff and student surveys to look at the nature of the problem of contract cheating. And this is a really interesting finding. We surveyed about 1,100 academic staff from eight institutions across Australia. Roughly a third of them said that they had never marked a piece of work that they suspected had been written by somebody other than students. But two thirds said that they had suspected, but only half of them went on to report that to an academic integrity decision maker. When we asked them why they didn't report, the dominant reason was it's impossible to prove. And I want to tackle that one head on today. And that's something that I know Jasmine's going to also shed some light on and amplify and illuminate as well. But let's have a look at some of the other dominant reasons. Too time consuming was the next biggest. That's where technology can come in to help us. Didn't know how to pursue it. That's again where the technology can help us out. But look at these ones that are all clustered around the institution. Staff not supported by senior managers to pursue it and didn't trust my institution's policies and processes. That's telling us something very important about the fact that as institutions, we also need to shift and change to change what we're doing and to change how we approach things because the problem we're addressing is changing. 
But this is what we talk about when we talk about reactive and effective whack a mole. It's all of these things that they're good things to do and they're important things to do, such as blocking SAML websites, the wonderful International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating, taking down posters on our campus, and, and the wonderful idea that my colleagues Kane and David, I can't remember which one of you came up with this one, it might have been Kane, it might have been David, to stick our own QR code onto the posters over there to redirect students to our support. I know this is something that involves Kane reporting links on Chegg, taking, doing takedown requests for Course Hero. They are exhausting, they're expensive, and they're eventually ineffective because they just pop up again, just like whack a mole. And the big one, not talking to our students about the contract cheating problem because we think it's going to the, alert them to it. These are things that we probably should keep doing them, but on their own, they're not going to make that much of a difference. They are what I call the deterrence side of the solution. What I'm wanting to advocate for today is that we move our energies into the detection side of the solution. And what we're advocating for um, is very much a partnership model. On the one hand, the people in roles like Kane is in his role on the investigative side of the problem, where we're looking at things that only can be seen from an investigative point of view. They won't be things that are spotted by individual academic staff at the point of marking. And this was a paper that David and Kane delivered at the 2019 ICAI conference, which was our first big detection yield after my master here at UNSW. They developed a whole pile of intelligence and, sk and skill through that process, which has led them on to much more interesting and um, productive lines of inquiry. On the other side of the partnership model are the academics. The academic judgment and the role that it can play inside the detection process and even to kick the detection process off is really critically important. And this is another paper that we gave at the 2020 ICAR conference which was really looking at the role that academic judgment should or can and should play in the detection process. And this is where I want to drill into digging this into this in a little bit more detail, and particularly the role that technology plays. Because really what we're looking at here is, if you like, a business flow or a business process of how we get from suspicion to evidence. And really there's sort of three main players in the game, and this is what they often tend to look like. There's the marker, who really is the point of often the point of suspicion, the investigator that can be people in Kane's role and people in my sort of role as a, an academic integrity officer. And then we've got the decision maker, which in various institutions could be individual or a group of individuals, or it could be a panel, uh, it could be a committee, all sorts of things. And what we're really interested in doing, and this is something that's a product of a lot of conversations that have taken place between me and David and Kane. So people in the investigative role and people in the academic role. And these are some of the key things that we think we've, we've really uncovered, which is that detection really is made up of four key steps. Suspicion that then moves on to investigation, that then arrives at a determination. And I like thinking about a successful determination as not producing false negatives and not producing false positives. Um, and that that decision survives appeal. So all of these decisions must be appellable, but it's only when that decision has survived appeal that we really can say that detection has taken place. Now, when we come to the first of these layers, the suspicion layer, Kane and, and David and I have coined what we call the three commandments of academic judgment. Know thy students, as individuals and as a cohort. Know thy course, and particularly the learning outcomes and the assessment requirements, and what's typical of a response from the students in this context. And know thy content, particularly the scholars and the scholarship. And this is where I really want to uh, acknowledge the outstanding work of Anne Rogerson from the University of Wollongong, who's been a leading voice in the, um, in the detection space for a very long time, particularly in terms of what bibliographies can yield. And I'm growing increasingly confident that bibliographic forensics is going to be a really critically important part of this academic judgment piece. But one of the things we do know to be true is it's very, very difficult. And I would say this myth that it's impossible to prove really comes out of the fact that it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get enough evidence out of a single document submission by a student to uphold an allegation of contract. 
to convince a decision maker on balance of probability that contract cheating has occurred. And that's because there's very little information, there's very rarely enough information coming out of a single document for us to support a claim. It's always helpful to be able to compare that document either to other documents submitted by other students or to other documents submitted by the same student. If we think about the sort of information you can harvest off a document, it often tells some information about individual computers that have been involved in the production of that document and different people involved in the production of that document. And if we think about comparing documents across a program of study, so thinking about this as a kind of timeline from left to right, these are the sorts of patterns that we start to see emerging contract cheating cases. And I can imagine Kane sort of thinking through a couple of instances or a couple of cases where we can see this sort of pattern emerging. The ones you can see encased in the blue dotted lines would be examples of the work being done by the student. But you can see there's a computer change that's happened about halfway through this student's career. What we can see here is a consistency that the document was last modified by the same person and by the same two computers, but they were created by different documents. And this could tell a story of a student who comes to university and tries to do the work on their own, perhaps gets to a pinch point in their career and resorts to contract cheating, gets away with it, goes back to doing their own work, but then again uses contract cheating again in the future when they are getting desperate, and then eventually slips into contract cheating all the time. And we might even notice that um, the contract cheating providers then start outsourcing the work to other providers as well, and other people's fingerprints, unbeknownst to the student, can start to turn up on the student's documents. The point I'm making here is that it's important to be able to compare documents to each other. And this is where the technology comes in and Turnitin's authorship has been really critically helpful in terms of improving and speeding up the time it takes to compare documents to each other. And I think it's critical to explain what authorship doesn't do. It doesn't detect contract cheating, it doesn't prove anything and it certainly doesn't prepare the brief of evidence for you. But some of the things it does do is it collects documents submitted by that student to Turnitin and compares them to each other or it compares two or more documents to each other that you've uploaded and reports on what it finds in the comparison and then flags discrepancies. And ultimately what it does is it saves us a hell of a lot of time. So that's just one example of how the technology can help us inside an institution in terms of improving the efficacy, the efficiency of our detection process inside an institution. And the partnership is involved between professional investigators and professional academic staff in terms of using their academic judgment. It's that partnership model that's really yielding the results in the institutions that are getting that model working well. But one of the things I'm keen for us to start to explore is how we can start to share what we're learning and work collaboratively with each other across the sector, not just from one university to another, but across a whole sector of universities working together in partnership to share information and to share the load. And I'm arguing that this needs to be something that is done under the auspices of our regulator. And now that we have the new integrity unit, it's ideally positioned to help support us and guide us and form these partnership models. I'm arguing that we need to work in partnership with each other under the auspices and with the guidance and support of our regulator to really achieve outcomes because that's allowing us to work on a national scale and with the help of our regulators establish international partnerships with other regulators who can also work in partnership with their higher education providers thereby establishing more of an international partnership that we could join up with New Zealand UK and the Republic of Ireland, South Africa, and eventually to rest of the Anglophone world. And it's this partnership model that I'm really advocating for. The partnership would be an opportunity for us to share and collaborate on things. I guess what I'm arguing for is that we are never going to gain much if we compete with each other on this. It's not gonna make any of us look good and it's just gonna burn a lot of energy and time. But if we can partner and share expertise intelligence and information, methods and mechanisms, 
even if we can share resource where the bigger and richer institutions could share resource with the smaller and less well-off institutions and where we can share tools and use tools to share and share how we use them we can get together to beat this problem because my argument is the collective brain power and the collective wisdom of the universities of the world can never be beaten by these insidious, predatory, um, moral, morally bankrupt contract cheating providers. Now, another part of this, it's not just the partnership side of it, but it's also the leadership side of this, because this problem is not isolated to higher education providers. It's going on in high schools and probably primary schools. It's going on in theological colleges. It's going on in military colleges. And if we stop and have a think about the national security implications of that, it's quite terrifying. It's going on in community colleges and TAFEs. It's also affecting accrediting bodies and private independent higher education providers. And just as we need to provide them with leadership, so do our regulators. If you think about what those organisations are regulated by, it's organisations like these. And I've chosen um, New South Wales or Australian examples, but there'd be an equivalent elsewhere as well. We can't realistically expect these regulatory or um, accrediting or overseeing bodies to be able to provide the support and guidance that somebody like Texa can with its integrity unit. So I'm arguing for a model of leadership and partnership where we work in partnership with each other. And one of the reasons why working with a regulatory agency is important, and this is a big point that Kane makes, is that the, the auspices of our regulatory agencies help us to share information without breaching privacy. As soon as we start breaching privacy, we've dropped all sorts of balls, including procedural fairness, and the regulators can help us with that. Um, and so it's this partnership and leadership model that I'm really advocating for. But there's a lot of arrows flying around here on this map, and it's a bit mind boggling. So I guess this is the last piece of the puzzle. We need technology to help us out. And this is where organisations and, and outfits like Turnitin can really help because of the way that they connect us, even without us having to be connected. There are risks and limitations to the use of, of um, solutions like Turnitin, but with, with opportunities as well. The solutions that they're develop, um, providing are still developing. That's an opportunity as well, because we can help out and guide them in their development. There is still resistance to their use. They don't work on their own and they must be implemented in our organisations to work, but those implementation costs can be high, far exceeds the cost of the licence. But sitting alongside these are some homegrown and local solutions that are being built. And I know of a few of them around the country and around the world that are being developed. But if we don't join up and partner with each other, there are risks and limitations here. The different institutions are spending a lot of time and energy reinventing the wheel that too many of them are developing these tools, but they're flying blind. They don't really know the nature of the problem they're tackling. And everybody in a time of COVID especially is dealing with constrained resource. The old adage that 10 people working together will always achieve more than one person competing against the other nine has never been truer than it is now. We will gain much, much more if we collaborate than if we compete. So the technology part of this is critically important. And that's why um, I'm advocating for solutions that are scalable, probative, transferable, and that smash the business model of the contracting providers. This is how we get away from the reactive, ineffective whack-a-mole. But we can only smash their business model if we take the time to discover and understand the business models at work. So the thing that I'm really championing at the moment is we think of this as a jigsaw that we're all trying to solve. And some of us have only got one piece, some of us might have a corner piece, some of us have, may have no pieces at all. But we're always going to achieve more if we try to solve this jigsaw puzzle together and to see what pieces we've got, whether they click together, whether they're the same pieces as each other. And slowly, together, we can fill in the picture, which is how do we solve the problem of contract cheating? So that's it from me.
Chuck, do you want me to pass back to you or do you want me to pass straight on to Jasmine? Just for time, we'll just, just pass, for time, we'll just pass straight, straight to straight Jasmine. Up. Jasmine. Great. Thank you, Chuck. I'll just need my um, slides put up, uh, David, if you're able to do that. But yeah. um, just yeah. before just before those arrive, um, my reputation in this field is clearly nowhere near uh, cats. But it, this is a relatively uh, this is a new position for me. But my background um, has been in privacy law and then working in higher education uh, for quite a while. I like to joke that finally my PhD in ethics actually comes in handy. Um, but I also just really want to thank Kath um, because she's been a fantastic um, guide for us in sort of redeveloping our, our policy and dealing with um, some particular incidents that we have. So thank you, Kath. But I'll pick up, um, I'll sort of pick up on themes uh, that Kath was talking about, about technology uh, being quite useful. And I also just want to provide an overview of what USQ is doing in this space. So I'll just take you through um, our online exams and current approach, our policy changes and um, how, you know, certain sections, certain wording has, has helped us to deal with contract cheating cases, our educative approach and then our detection and um, penalties that we have as well. So as everyone went through uh, last year with COVID, everything went online and, and USQ being a, a predominantly um, online and distance provider, it wasn't quite the struggle I think that some universities had, but it was still a major change to remove paper-based exams and replace them with alternate forms of assessment. So that um, sort of included a take-home exam that was all online or um, uh, the quiz function within Noodle. So our um, student support team was absolutely on the ball. There was a lot of messaging around how students can prepare. We had uh, messaging around academic integrity and there was 24 seven support available to students during this exam period. But obviously um, there is no silver bullet and uh, we still experienced um, cheating and uh, some issues as all universities do. So as this was happening, um, we were redeveloping our new policy and our new procedure and our new penalty schedule. And some of the major changes that uh, we went through and we have built on um, is the first major one is we're taking a very educative approach to this. So our duty as a university is we're here to educate staff and students on how to deal with academic integrity um, and how to deal with matters of misconduct. So our first um, sort of major overhaul was mandating that all students have to undertake an academic integrity training module. And I'll take you through um, that in a little bit more detail on my next slide. But we also were very fortunate to have um, senior executive support and they authorised the creation of a dedicated academic integrity unit of which I'm the associate director. And um, at this stage, I have uh, one colleague, Rian Roo, who is an academic integrity coordinator. And we also have um, one academic per school who undertakes additional duties as an academic integrity officer. So it's definitely a whole of university approach and uh, we're all working very collaboratively. So all um, allegations as well come from the academic integrity unit, which provides us with the opportunity to um, ensure that procedural fairness is followed to make sure that there's consistency across disciplines and it also separates the decision making obviously so our decision making um, now comes from uh, or comes from the head of school and then it can be moved up to the associate dean. So to take you through our educative approach this is for both staff and students. So mandatory training for students this is something that was developed in-house um, with a working group. So our library took carriage of this development and it's set up within um, our LMS, which at USQ we use Moodle. So it appears just like any other course that the student has to take. And it provides an introduction to academic integrity. So we try, to switch, we try to make it very clear why academic integrity is important, um, that students belong to an academic community, that it's all part of being a scholar. And then we go through um, all our new 
policy definitions, uh, the consequences, assignment preparation, copyright and referencing, and then direct the students to various support that we have um, in in different areas across the university. So they might be struggling, they might not know um, who to turn to. So we have a central student support who can refer to uh, wellbeing or to library or to any type of um, support like that. So we've had um, really good uptake. It's a way that technology is able to, um, you know, sort of support academic integrity and in that with uh, limited and restricted access to the first assessment item. Um, so every single coursework student has to undertake this training. And then by using the restrict access function within Moodle, um, we're able to make sure that students have to complete this before they're able to do their first assessment items. For staff, um, we've had, uh, we've been trying to come up with sort of ways that we can um, invite all types of staff into the into the conversation. So we don't just see this as academic integrity as something that um, is just for academic staff. We also make sure that our um, all our professional staff have who have touch points within the process that they're able to sort of access this training as well. So this is again being something we've just developed in house. And we always start off, um, we start with the policy and we start with procedural fairness. Again, I think there's sometimes some, some size and uh, people think, oh, this is a bit boring, but that's the problem when you've got someone with legal training in charge. We always like to go back to the policy and um, looking at all the, um, you know, various uh, sections and, and how they actually look practically. So we sort of pull apart the policy, what it actually looks like for all of those roles, and um, we contextualise. So the next part is case studies, and that's really important to, I think, sort of situate academic integrity and misconduct and show the different types, because uh, we know that our maths-based disciplines have a very different experience of academic misconduct compared to our humanities um, disciplines. So we go through assignments and how the um, technologies are actually um, sort of helping uh, us detect this sort of information. Uh, so we'll go through some Turnitin reports, we'll have a look at some authorship investigate reports, and also just some of our in-house technical data that we've collected, like um, IP addresses and VPNs and that type of thing. We also have gone through um, and we'll be doing a lot more sort of role plays and interviews because we found that the interview is so crucial to having um, sort of to helping us build our cases and obviously it provides the students with their right of response so it's really important that we get that right. And as an academic integrity unit, we're here to um, help the academic integrity officers who um, often conduct those interviews. We'll provide them with a sort of brief. Uh, we'll summarise the evidence and then we'll provide them with questions that they can ask as well. Uh, we also then like to end with a student, uh, for this training day, we like to end with a student perspective panel. So trying to actually get some students along um, who are willing to talk about this. But when we can't do that, we like to get the professional staff and support staff who actually are frontline and they deal with the students, um, you know, when they are at their most stressed, when they're at their most vulnerable, um, and our student guild as well, just to share that perspective of what this actually looks like. Um, for the student because depending on where you are in the process sometimes it can be easy to forget that this is a student going through this and this is actually their experience. Another um, thing we've found particularly helpful um, is SharePoint which I'm sure that uh, every university is um, you know using if we've got Microsoft and this has been something that has been um, sort of advertised through internal newsletters, um, used at you know, every opportunity really. And we divide it up into um, education, prevention, detection, and then reporting and processing. So we have the real um, sort of technical documentation. How do you use our, um, you know, how do you use our online reporting system? So it's another thing that we've had built in house which um, is an online you know, reporting system for academic integrity, that at least has taken some of the pain out of the paper-based process that um, I'm sure put, put people off reporting. Uh, now at least it's just sort of one click, you go to a form, you put all the details in, and then it's recorded um, for then the next person in the process to be able to generate the letters to be sent out to students. So that's one way that we've been able to try to streamline things. 
but having sort of just one source of information has been really useful for our um, for our staff. As far as learning and teaching approaches go, and um, I won't go too far into this, but then I know this is um, you know an Ascolite presentation, but as as our educative approach, we are absolutely um, encouraging the fact that we need to be looking at courses and we need to be looking at assessment. And these are um, sort of seven factors, of course, by um, Bertrand Gallant that we're trying to um, sort of socialise across the university and use as a basis for um, some of our education campaigns. So those seven factors for instruction quality, stress and pressure, availability of opportunity, which of course has been increased with all the move online and having all sort of online assessment, uh, perception of consequences, language barriers, performance culture and ethical decision making. So once you click on one of those, then it just takes you down the page and we've got what is the problem and here are our strategies for addressing the problem. Um, and that just sort of takes you off to some, um, you know, links like videos we produce in house, some recordings of workshops that we've done, um, and then examples of what our staff are doing across the institution. So this is, you know, what our constructive alignment looks like. And then there's like contact details there as well for um, contacting other people who might be able to help. So having SharePoint um, and just that single source has been really useful for us. So once, um, you know, once we've actually gone through all that educative process, obviously we're still going to be experiencing misconduct. So in terms of detection, we, um, we use Turnitin as an institution and we do actively encourage uptake um, in all courses. So in order to um, support that, our academic development team run Turnitin workshops throughout semester. And that's really focused on, um, again, that educative approach. How can you use Turnitin for feedback? How can you use it? Um, so the student, uh, uh, Kath earlier said and in the chat, I noticed that we were talking about um, uh, students keeping drafts of their work. Uh, in a few of our courses, we have students who um, they actually use Turnitin multiple times and you can see the versioning, uh, which is really useful. And they're actually encouraged to use Turnitin as a, um, you know, educative and feedback tool to fix their referencing as opposed to, okay, you submitted a paper and then it's come back 41% and it's a problem. We also use the Authorship Investigate uh, module, which is a, an add-on uh, to pay for and get additional licensing for. That's something that we just use as an academic integrity unit. So we see ourselves um, as sort of the... Uh, strategic point for academic integrity for the university and to make sure there's a, um, a sort of connected approach to academic integrity that everyone's doing the same There's consistency. So we maintain those licenses in our unit and how we um, use that is it will provide you with, uh, you know, a number of students that you should actually um, you know, you should look at like high risk students, but we've found that we use it more when we get markers coming to us, we get lecturers coming to us and they've, uh, they have a concern, they have a gut feel, they might think, oh, I'm just not too sure that, you know, something looks wrong, but I'm just not sure. So authorship at least can provide us a little bit more um, of that automation of looking at all the metadata, which is really useful. Um, and that's actually another thing that we've done too. We've tried to mandate as best as possible that Word documents are submitted rather than PDFs as we just find it a bit easier at this point for us to go through um, that metadata. So um, as I said, the integrity unit here, we provide um, support for lecturers with sort of one-off concerns. Sometimes they might sense that, you know, is there actually a contract cheating problem within our course? So we're able to not only use Turnitin, but also use um, a sort of in-house solution that um, sort of gathers all the data. It sort of aggregates all of the data from Moodle for us so that we can uh, check things like IP addresses, um, VPNs. And that's that sort of is the technology and the, um, the data, I guess, that we're finding really useful in our contract cheating cases. So um, we always go back to the actual assessment item as our, as our main piece of evidence. But by being able to um, get factors out of Moodle, such as, you know, what IP address was um, this submitted from, are there actually, you know, uh, 10 different students who are all at the same IP address, however we know they don't all live in the same location. Um, it just gives us that jumping point that we're able to do more investigation. 
and some other things, um, for example, with our online exams, uh, you know, we can easily then see multiple like start and stop times. And it's all about building um, building a narrative on each of these students in each of these cases. So one of these things alone, um, it doesn't really um, it, it doesn't really mean anything just because potentially there's a different name within the author field in Word um, that's easily explained away. Just because two students use the same IP address, again, maybe they just live together. But once you look at the IP address and then you see that they started and ended at the same time, and then you see that they also um, were completing questions at the same time, that's how we start to um, sort of build that narrative. So we, we do, um, predominantly as the integrity unit, we uh, try to spot the contract cheating, um, which I think we're probably fortunate um, in that we don't have, you know, we don't have huge numbers. This isn't something that's absolutely, you know, overwhelming us or anything. But we find the plagiarism, that's more um, detected by lecturers and markers. But like Kat said, it's so important to have um, this community and it's so important to have uh, collaboration with, you know, your academic staff, with markers, uh, with um, ICT, um, for example, our cybersecurity team have been absolutely fantastic with helping us gather this data and um, a willingness to, you know, run these reports, identify when there are suspicious IPs being used, when um, there's VPN use um, is quite predominant. And one thing that was quite interesting with one of our cases that really sort of triggered us looking into it further was the VPNs um, weren't terminating in the student's home country when their excuse was, oh, well, no, I just use it to do my banking um, in my home country. It was actually um, terminating in Australia to look as though it had been submitted from Australia when really it was an agent um, in Asia who was submitting it instead. So um, sort of some of the technologies that have been really helpful um, and of course it's so important to work together as a university and like I said we're very fortunate at USQ to have the buy-in um, across the institution that this is sort of everyone's problem this isn't just you know a marker this isn't just a course problem we all need to be looking at it and so once we do detect um, again with our new uh, penalty schedule and our update we really distinguish between sort of the inexperienced student versus the um, sort of active intent to deceive so we go between sort of category one is inadequate study skills inexperienced student the penalty for that is resubmission or warning we'll also ensure that the students um, are connected to a learning advisor within the library to help them with their referencing um, and category two is where there is significant plagiarism, um, there's deliberate deception, so where, you know, you get a student copying and pasting something from Wikipedia, but then they're putting it through a synonym generator and it just reads, you know, incorrectly. Um, one of my favourites was a constitutional law paper where they had to talk about the separation of powers and instead the whole assignment was discussing the division of energy. So it's just also educating staff about like those little things. If it doesn't read right, then there's probably something not quite right going on. So that's um, everything from me. And I think that Chuck would like to talk about um, the Turnitin ebook that is available. Perfect. So answer any questions after you're done. All right, perfect. Um, just before we get into questions, we thought we'd share with you that we recently released um, this ebook on strategies and tactics for combating um, contract cheating. Um, here you learn about um, some tactics um, to do with um, contract cheating. We actually have this really cool um, interview with an SA Mill insider. And yeah, the book is, is available now. Um, I think Janice is also going to, okay, David has actually posted a link to that. Feel free to download that and read. Um, we're also open to getting your feedback with regards to um, some of the strategies um, we've highlighted in the ebook. And uh, yeah, now we're gonna move because we have uh, about 10, 10, 12 minutes. Um, David, what's the protocol for the Q and A? Um, I have been very engaged with the presenters. I haven't been looking um, at the chat, but I can see it, it is really, really busy. So we, uh, yeah, the chat has been really busy and we've had a few questions come up and a few comments that um, uh, might be of interest. So one of the questions that came up early on, and I actually might ask Kane to speak to it because he seems to know about a bit, bit about this, um, but the question was what, um, in referring to the metadata in documents, both Word and PDF documents particularly, um, 
where people purge metadata. Um, someone was asking, is there a way to actually track that? So, Kane, you had you you had some insights into this. Can you flick your mic on and just give us a, a, a quick rundown on what the possibilities are there? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so, effectively, a Word document is a zip file. If you want to think about it, like the, the front end that you and I see when we type is effectively a user front to a set of zipped files. And inside that is XML data, which tells you things about a document. And one of those things, if you go into the settings for any Word document you want to look at, um, you can see, I'll just open one up so I'm not going to mislead anyone. So if you go under file and info and the inspect document function, so any user can inspect the document and then remove all the data and how the document would appear after that is it would appear as if the document was created the second you opened it. So let's say someone sends you an, uh, a document and you open it and it says, it started at 2.48 p.m. on the 22nd of April, despite the fact that it's got all this text in it. Um, that's an indication that the document has been deliberately purged. Um, I've heard whisperings that there are some jurisdictions in which word data is automatically purged, but I've never seen any concrete evidence of that. Um, but, and as I said in the chat, the that generally speaking, a student won't start out doing this. It's, you know, you think about a reasonable kind of put yourself in a student's shoes. They start out trying to attempt things and then it's once that effort fails for various reasons that they look for other options. And so the departure from the pattern should be the kind of overriding view that you have when you're looking at this data. How is this different from their existing patterns? What, is their doc what do their documents look like when they are identifiable as themselves? Like Joe Bloggs, student, creates document, last modifies a document, has a fair bit of time worked on it. It came from a particular uh, software set. How would, um, how would that differ from other documents which may have their own suspicions raised independently, say through an academic sniffing that there's something wrong. Um, I hope that's helpful. Great, that does that does shed a little bit of light on. It sounds a little bit technical, um, it is but technical, yeah, yeah, but it, yeah, but it does it does actually shed some light on that question. Um, the other um, one of the other questions that came up, Shiona. Um, was asking what would be the role of Turnitin partnerships, particularly if not all institutions actually buy into Turnitin. Um, and I think this was more, Shiana, you can clarify the question, but I think it was a little more around about privacy and student data um, and how that's treated um, or how that might be treated in these partnership arrangements. Shiana, do you want to speak more to that? This was a question from early on. No, oh, um, thanks. I was just wondering, I just thought Alternatin has all of this metadata in this gigantic, you know, pool or lake or whatever this data, and you would presumably be able to see author, authorship that is common um, across institutions and potentially, you know, flag ghostwriters who are serving more than one institution. Do you know what I mean? Like matching kind of data across institutions, but whether or not that's something that's out of reach. Um, but yeah, you'd think that there'd be some hot spots there potentially in the data that you have. That Can, I speak, has. Can I speak to that, Dave? Because that's precisely where I'm Absolutely. going with my thinking, right? Shona, if, if we were to discover probative evidence and even have students admit that yes, a document with a particular set of characteristics and a particular set of document properties was produced by a contract cheating author and then that information with its very similar document with very similar characteristics and the same document properties turns up at QUT 
wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to do all of that investigative work and we could just say to you that we have probative, we have discovered that this is probative evidence, you should consider it to be probative too. And that's the sort of thing that, that potentially, I mean, we'd have to think through all the privacy and all of the confidentiality and data sharing and all of that sort of stuff. But wouldn't it be good if we could then start to pull information nationally via our accrediting, our regulatory body? I mean, I think this is probably something that techs would have to have oversight of, but turn it in or an equivalent kind of set of tools could give us the mechanism for doing the sharing. Wouldn't it be good as, if, as soon as a paper like that turns up at QUT, it could be flagged as this has been found to have been probative evidence at another university, this needs investigation. I think that would be brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, Suja asked, how do you, uh, and actually Suja and Laureen have both asked similar questions. Um, when it comes to Turnitin and, and we talked about being able to view that versioning, um, Laureen was curious if the two, if the markers could actually see the various versions. Um, and Suja has asked a more general question, how do you see those various versions of student assessments? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm happy to add to that as um, it's not like a not for us. Um, it's I'm not familiar if there is like a proper versioning function so much as we just ask students to put it through um, multiple times and upload each version and then a comparison is done. So it's it's not um, it's not a nice clean process and I'm very sorry if I got anyone excited. Um, but it's just we we definitely try to use it as a feedback tool. So um, multiple uploads. Thanks for that, Jasmine. Um, uh, David asks, is there any recourse against organizations that put bundles of past student papers online for future students to use? Uh, and one of the things that I think we've got to be really better at communicating to our students about um, is that the contract trading providers, the commercial contract trading providers are hungry for copy. They'll do anything they can to get copy. And I don't know if you guys saw the story that was recently in um, the Australian and before that, the Times Higher, um, that some work that um, three scholars in the United States, um, Kane can talk to this probably much better than I can because he actually understands it better than I can. I do. Um, three colleagues in the United States um, have discovered contract cheating companies hacking into university websites. And I don't know if you saw the warning that Tex issued both to providers and to our students about this. Yeah, Kane's put the link in the, um, in the chat. We asked them, we got in touch with them, we asked them if they could do a similar uh, analysis of the edu.au domain and they found a whole pile of compromised university websites. But the reason I bring this and why I think it's relevant to your question um, is that one of the things that seems to have occurred is what looks to be fraudulent essay writing competitions being run by these contract cheating providers with the promise of a $2,000 scholarship. And, as far as we can tell, it was never a real competition and there was never a real prize. But the point of the competition, of course, was that the contract cheating providers were able to harvest a whole pile of student essays. Um, so this kind of providing previously written assignments um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if this is quite the spirit of your, your question, but organisations that are putting bundles of past student papers um, whether it be students, whether it be commercial cheating providers, whether it be um, organisations that have, have duped students into providing this information, whether it be Course Hero, whether it be Chegg, whatever, these are all huge honeypots for, um, for contract cheating providers, but they're also tra traps, if you like, for contract cheating providers. So I guess I mention all that, not pro probably not because it gives a great answer to your question, David, but more to just expose the insidious, um, predatory, amoral, foul behaviour of these contract training providers. And 
it kind of gives me an opportunity to go back to something that I'm really preaching from the rooftops or shouting from the rooftops at the moment. I talk about the wisdom of the universities of the world can't be beaten by these providers. But one of the things that sets us apart from the contract cheating industry is that we care about our students and they don't. They don't care about our students at all. They just care about exploiting them for money. And the fact that we care about our students will mean that we're more likely to succeed. So it's a bit of a weird answer to your question, David, but yeah. I think it's a really, really actually excellent place for us to, uh, to stop um, for today. Um, Chuck, did you have any final remarks that you wanted to make before we call a close to this? The only final remarks is to the amazing presenters. Thank you so much. This has been very eye-opening. I've, I've been uh, I've been trying to keep very focused on what's been said, but I can hear the chat just going up. So it's, it sounds like um, it worked out well. We looked at, we we tried to focus the session on more practical solutions and learning from the USQ um, environment is actually was actually superb. So thank you and thank you to David for this opportunity to collaborate and um, bring bring this message to the uh, the rest of the academic community. Yes. And so on behalf of Ascolite, we want to thank each of you for joining us today uh, for this webinar, and we hope you'll join us again in the future. Uh, we do have two upcoming webinars, first on the 11th of May 2021 in conjunction with the Australasian Journal um, of Educational Technology. We're presenting a review and showcase of smart learning environments, so please watch out for that. Those details are coming soon. Um, and then later on the 2nd of June, we have part two of the Ask a Light Turn It In co-sponsored sessions. Um, and that presentation, e-cheating and assessment security, best practices for upholding academic integrity in a digital world, will feature Ann Rogerson, who was referenced today, um, as well as Phil Dawson uh, from uh, Deakin. Uh, so we hope you can join us for that. And with that, uh, we want to thank you for coming along and have a great rest of the afternoon.